All right, welcome. Uh, good morning and welcome to Sir John Stone's Museum. My name is Talila Smart and I am the Learning Officer at the museum. So here, uh, and I'll be virtually showing you around the museum today. Now, oh, sorry about that. Let me see what happened there. There we go. So here is the outside of the museum um, on a very bright and sunny day. Um, there are just three buildings um, from left to right, numbers 12, 13, and 14, joined in a row. Number 13 juts out in the center, drawing your attention um, from number 12 and 14 as the main museum entrance. Now these houses were built one at a time over a period of 30 years. Number 12 was the first built in 1792, then number 13 in 1810, and finally number 14 in 1824. Each house took about two years to build, but were constantly being altered on the inside. When we first opened in 1837, the museum and all its offices were confined to number 13, with number 12 and 14 sold. Today, both sides of the house, or both side houses, have been incorporated into the museum to house our shop, library, and conservation studio, an art room and offices, leaving as much of number 13 open to the public as possible. The museum was founded on the conditions that it should always be free, open, and nothing shall be changed. And although we were shut for World War II and the pandemic, and some things have been altered over the years for safety, I am happy to say we have always been free. As this is Sir John Soane's museum, I think I should introduce you to the man himself. Here is, on the image, on the left is an image of a painted portrait of Sir John Soane, an architect and the founder of this museum. Surrounded by a deep red backdrop, he looks to be middle-aged and kindly looks out from you from the painting, welcoming you to his museum. Sir John Soane was born in 1753 and died in 1837, living during the Georgian and Regency era. He had this portrait painted by Sir Thomas Lawrence, who was not only one of the best portrait artists of the era and the presence of the Royal Academy of Arts, but also Soane's friend and colleague. Soane was very pleased with this portrait, particularly because Soane was actually 76 when this was painted. He doesn't look it, but that's largely due to the efforts of Lawrence, who was very good at flattering his sitters. Soane is also wearing a hint of rouge on his cheeks and lips, and his real white hair was covered by a brown horsehair wig. From this portrait and his houses, you might imagine that Soane was born into this rich lifestyle. However, he was actually the seventh child of a bricklayer. His father died when he was only 15 years old, and he had to quit school to join his brother working on construction sites. Soane loved to learn and constantly had his head in a book, even while at work, so his family managed to get him a job as an errand boy slash apprentice for an architect in London. This architect was George Dance the Younger, one of the most one of the founders of the Royal Academy. This position is where Soane began to learn and fall in love with architecture. Soane impressed Dance so much that he was offered a place at the Royal Academy for free to study architecture. While Soane was studying, he entered lots of competitions to try and stand out from the crowd of students. And at the age of 25, he won the gold medal for a design of a triumphal bridge. Here is a watercolor painting of Soane's design of a triumphal bridge. The image is a little faded and seems to have a blue haze running across the scene, but you can make out an extravagant bridge crossing a wide river full of boats and barges. In the background, you can faintly make out another bridge and the silhouette of Westminster Abbey, indicating that Soane imagined this bridge to be built in London. The bridge is grand and ambitious, full of details echoing ancient Greek and Roman buildings. It was so impressive. The design was shown to King George III, who was so impressed that he decided to grant Soane the King's Travelling Scholarship. This allowed Soane to travel around Europe, mainly Italy, for three years, all expenses paid. This trip had a huge influence on Soane. Before, he had only ever seen these buildings and sketches or described in books, but now he was inside the ruins of the Colosseum, exploring the ruins of Pompeii. He visited Rome, Venice, Naples, Florence, Sicily, and even Malta for a brief time. 
His exposure to these ancient wonders ignited a fire within him. He himself needed to create buildings that would also stand the test of time and maybe in thousands of years be rediscovered as ruins by young architects and inspire them. He never loses his desire to leave a lasting mark on the landscape of London. This trip was also influential for Soam because he was traveling alongside some very wealthy families who had gone on this grand tour. Back in London, Soam was far too low born to be spoken to. However, on the trip, the social lines blurred and he befriended some very influential people. When Soam returned to London to set up his own practice, he immediately found a line of clients waiting for him to design a townhouse, a countryside manor, or in one case, a very extravagant kennel. Back in London, So met a man who had become very important in his life. George Wyatt worked as a clerk of the paving the city of London and met Soane a few times on business. Wyatt introduced Soane to Eliza Smith, his niece. On the right is a rectangular pencil portrait of her on white paper, sat in a chair looking out at the viewer. Her face is, has the most detail, her hair tied up in the fashion of the time, her high collared dress and gloved hands only faintly sketched. She was orphaned in childhood and raised by her uncle. Her and Soane hit it off, having a lot in common, for example, sharing a love of Shakespeare. She married Soane in 1784 and they had two sons, John Jr. and George. In 1790, Wyatt sadly died. The family, of course, was devastated. However, Soane and Eliza were surprised to discover that Wyatt had left everything in his will to them. Tallulah, Tallulah. I'm, yes. so, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Could you slow down a touch? It's very Absolutely. hard to interpret that quickly, please. Thank you Absolutely so much. Absolutely no problem. <laughs> Thank you very much. No problem. So in 1790, Wyatt sadly died. Um, the family was, of course, devastated. However, Soane and Eliza were surprised to discover that Wyatt had left everything in his will to them. And it was a lot more than they had imagined. Overnight, they inherited a wealth of 12 million pounds in today's money. What is the first thing that Soane does with this money? He goes to auctions and buys anything that reminded him of his travels in Italy. He had no money to buy anything while he was traveling and actually lost some of his luggage on his way back through Europe. Now, he had all the money in the world, but no time to travel as he was too busy with work. So he bought anything he could in Britain. As his collection grew, he realized he needed somewhere to put it all. So, in 1792, Soane buys his first house in Lincoln's Fields, number 12, which he immediately knocks down to have it rebuilt to his design. On the left is a grey image of the floor plan of number 12. The entrance at the, to the house is at the bottom of the plan, and the room at the top, indicated by the black arrow, was originally stables. Soan didn't need stables, so he removed them and created an office space to work from and to hold his collection. In 1800, Soan also bought a countryside house called Pittshanger Manor in Ealing, which is now open as another museum to Soan. Most of his collection was kept there in the hopes that his sons would be inspired by the collection and want to become architects themselves. Eight years later, Soane realized they weren't interested and so decided to sell Pitt's hangar and buy and rebuild number 13 instead. The next house is much bigger than the first. Yeah. And Soane redesigned the back stables to create a gallery space. Then in 1824, Soane had bought four paintings and he had run out of space in his first two houses. So what did he do? He bought the third house in the row, number 14. Ooh. Which it's of similar size to 12. Soane rebuilt the stables shown at the top 
to create a picture room. As number 13 was the biggest of the three houses, when Soane bought it, he moved in and rented out number 12 and later number 14, keeping the back stables for his gallery. When you think about the shape of the original museum, think of it as a sort of T shape. The central house and the backs of all three linked, but the front sections of the side houses rented out. By the time that Soane died, he had collected around 45,000 objects, mainly architectural drawings, but thousands of books, paintings, sculptures, and I have the privilege of showing you around his rooms today. This is the first room you enter as a visitor to Sir John Soane's museum the library dining room. This was originally two separate rooms that jo uh, Soane joined together to create a very modern open plan space. The image on this slide shows you the library side of the room to the east, a very warm and cozy space. The color on the walls is a deep red with dark green edges. The red paint is called Pompeian red, inspired by the red found in wall paintings in Pompeii. There are two original leather armchairs either side of a central white marble fireplace, upon which rests a small model of a Roman temple of Castor and Pollux, of which only three columns survive. Above this is a large mirror which reflects light across the room from two French windows on the right and creates a warm glow by candlelight in the evenings. On either side of the fireplace are mahogany bookshelves, cabinets completely full of books. On top of the bookshelves are Greek vases. Some are original, but others are 18th century reproductions. The ceiling is quite peculiar Soane creates the tops of arches. They don't connect to the floor, but float over the bookshelves, holding more vases on fan-like shelves. In the, inside the arches on the back wall, there seems to be a gap with a view into another room, but they are just mirrors. This is the first example of Soane using mirrors to trick your eye. By placing mirrors around the museum, you are constantly catching glimpses of spaces you can't quite get to, objects you can't quite find. The next uh, Chalula, Hi, Harry, sorry, it's Yasmin. Um, I just wanted to let Tim know that his video is frozen. We haven't actually been able to see it. I was just checking that everyone else. Um, oh, no. I'm so yeah. sorry. I've been frozen the whole time. Um, I think you might have, Tim. Um, uh, in two seconds, I'll see if it's... I'm, I'm so sorry, I've had to change laptops at the no last No problem, week. these things happen. No I'm sorry. Does sorry, this, everyone. Does this make a difference? Am I visible now? Yes. Yes. I am. This is a lower quality camera. I was using my good camera, but I'll just change to this one and hope that it's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Sorry, everyone. So yes, the next image shows you the dining room side of the room. The warmth of the red continues into the side of the room. The wooden floor is covered by a brightly patterned rug replica of the original. The central dining room table and chairs were co-designed by Soane and the furniture maker. Soane wanting every aspect of his house to be exactly as he wanted. On the right wall, you can see Soane's portrait from the earlier slide, sat above another marble white fireplace and a small model of his design for Whitehall. He positioned his portrait opposite the entrance to this room on the left, so he would be there to greet you as you enter the museum. Soane's portrait and the painting opposite it are framed with mirrors covering most of the wall. So they seem to be floating in midair. If you stand in the right spot, the paintings also seem to float behind each other. And the mirrors also create an infinity effect 
reflecting endlessly. So the house really does feel like it goes on forever. On the back wall are more wooden bookshelves supporting a collection of busts and framing the back and uh, the back right and left doorways leading further into the museum. Behind the table is a large central window with some stained glass at the bottom, looking into a courtyard. And in front of you, you can in front you can see a symmetrical arrangement of seven vases, three pairs and one unique, not linked by geography or archaeology. But simply, uh, a style of curating, or by type, sorry, a style of curating typically to early museum practices. On the far left and right are two tall jade green Chinese celadon vases from the 18th century. The next in are two short sandy ala Egyptian alabaster vases from the 17th century. The next in are two small white Italian marble vases from the 17th century. And in the center stands an Apulian vase from the fourth century BCE. It is over 2000 years old. Here is a closer look at the Apulian vase. On the right is an image of the whole vase and on the left there is a close up of the details in the center. The vase is just under one meter tall and is of the crater type so it'll be used to mix water and wine for big dinner parties. The vase is decorated in red, red figure painting and shows a scene of the mythological origins of the Olympics, which bizarrely involves a lot of cheating. At the top of the vase is a geometric pattern called a Greek key pattern. And interestingly, sewn decorated to the windows behind this vase with the same pattern to show how much his designs take inspiration from the ancient Greeks. Now this is the breakfast room, Soane's favorite room in the museum. The yellow paint on the walls is accentuated by the yellow stained glass skylights, bringing in the illusions of warm sunlight into the space. The dome ceiling carries several convex mirrors and the whole room overall contains over 100 mirrors. This meant that in the morning, while Sam was having breakfast, the sunlight will come in through the east facing window on the right and be reflected across the room. He knew it was his most impressive room, showcasing the best features of his architecture so he would invite people around at the right time of day when the lighting would be perfect. So they would be so in awe of the space that they would stop so in mid sentence and say, you have to build me a room like this. In this room is another portrait of a very important member of the family. This is a painting of Fanny. Soane analyzes beloved Manchester Terrier. She sits looking out at a, a sunny Italian landscape, lazily perched on crumbling ruins, every bit the dog of a classical architect. The family had other dogs, but Fanny was by far the favorite. Eliza occasionally signing letters with Fanny's paw print. Fanny sadly died on Christmas Day in 1820, but Soan memorialized her with an impressive tomb, which we will see later, and this dramatic portrait. The breakfast room leads into the back of the museum, the dome space. This expansive space is illuminated by an array of yellow and orange skylights, bringing warmth to the abundant display of objects decorating every square inch of the walls and ceiling. The objects include original and plaster copies of ancient Greek and Roman architectural fragments. So in using these objects at first to inspire his designs, and then later to help instruct instruct his apprentices and students from the Royal Academy. 
his collection became an invaluable resource for students studying classical architecture who couldn't afford to go on the grand tour and later useful for all students as the outbreak of the Napoleonic Wars prevented travel into Europe. He created Britain's own mini grand tour. Overlooking the dome space is a plaster copy of the Apollo Belvedere, a Roman marble statue kept in the Vatican. Sohn uses the orange skylight behind the statue to emphasize Apollo as the god of the sun. Behind the statue, hidden in its base, Sohn added a small pull-out table where he would look through the gorgeous legs of Apollo across the stone space at his own bust. Here in the center of the image, this is the other side of the dome space and Sohn here looks across his vast collection. His bust was made by Francis Chantry, who said when he completed it, when he it was completed, that he had never created a final work but I can't tell if it is Sohn or Julius Caesar himself. Sohn, of course, very pleased by that comparison. Beneath Sohn are two smaller statues. On the left is Michelangelo, and on the right is Raphael. The best sculptor that ever lived, the best artist that ever lived, but above them both, the best architect that ever lived. Sohn was not a humble man by any means. The corridor behind Sohn has a lower ceiling and that is because it holds the drawing office, a space where Sohn's apprentices and students could sit and work. From his seat behind Apollo, Sohn could keep tabs on them through the small window at the top. If you continue down the corridor, you will come to the picture room, which we will visit in a moment, and see the beginnings of a grand and detailed painting of Venice by Canaletto. Sohn places the painting on this back wall. So from the other end of the dome space, he can sit behind Apollo and gaze at the painting. And from that distance, imagining that maybe it's not a painting, but perhaps an open window. Sohn was never able to go back to Italy after his grand tour, but he brings Italy to him through his collection. Before we move on to the picture room, I want to bring us downstairs as the dome has an open space in the center that looks into the basement below. Underneath Sohn's bust is the sepulchral chamber, a gloomy and cramped space that is lit up during the day by the skylights above and at night by candlelight. The main skylight creates a spotlight shining down onto the central Egyptian sarcophagus. The sarcophagus is an extraordinary object a single piece of Egyptian alabaster reaching almost three meters in length and completely engraved on the outside and inside with hieroglyphics. Sohn bought the sarcophagus in 1824 and after knocking down part of the wall to get it inside, he reorganized the basement to become an area dedicated to death and memorial. Take a to quickly take a closer look at the sarcophagus. You can see it here without the glass case, which was added on after Sohn's death to protect it. On the right, you can see the incredible effect of light on the stone, which is surprisingly translucent. After Sohn had interred the sarcophagus in his home, he filled the museum with candles and had not one, not two, but three nights of parties where he could show off 
he could, of course, show off his architecture and collection. The sarcophagus itself was originally made for the Egyptian pharaoh Seti I, who ruled between 1290 and 1270 BCE, making the sarcophagus over 3,000 years old. When newly built, the stone would have been a much crisper white and the hieroglyphics would have been painted in Egyptian blue so they would stand out. The hieroglyphics show the Book of the Gates, which describes the journey made and trials faced by the dead as they travelled to the afterlife, following the route the sun god Ra took every night. We will now travel back upstairs to the picture room. We have now moved into the back of number 14, the third house in the row. Here we see Canaletto's view of Venice in its full glory, alongside other remarkable paintings in Soane's collection. Once again, Soane has filled every square inch of the walls. Above, out of shot, is another skylight, bringing a cool light in the room. This room can be very peaceful when empty, but during the day, it will frequently be crowded with visitors itching to look at Soane's impressive collection. First, a closer look at the Canaletto. This view of Venice is known as Riva degli Schiavoni, and Canaletto recreates it in intricate detail but little accuracy. He didn't paint Venice as it was, but he painted it as the Venetians remembered it. If you were to go to that spot, you wouldn't quite see that view, but Canaletto has sort of squashed in all the best buildings into one view. The painting brings a warmth into the room, the blue of the sky and the lagoon transporting us into the bustling streets of Venice from inside a London townhouse. Next, we have an impressive collection of paintings, an election series by William Hogarth. If you remember before, I told you that Soane bought the entire house of number 14 to fit all paintings, these were the paintings, and they actually cost more than the house itself. William Hogarth was one of Britain's most famous artists, known for his cartoon-like paintings and prints that made scathing critiques of society. This series, in particular, critiquing the rampant corruption in the electoral process in the 1750s. The backdrops in each of these paintings are not real places, but recognisable locations and filled with su subtle portraits of real people. In all these panels, you can see the small pocket of eligible voters being swayed and manipulated by the candidates. In the top left scene, a luxurious banquet has been hosted for the voters and the mayor has had such a good time that he is overdosed on oysters and is having to be bled by his surgeon to revive him. On the top right, a successful farmer is taking invitations and bribes from both parties with no indication whether he will even vote. The bottom left shows voters queuing up on polling day at the time, you would have to put your hand on the Bible and say out loud who you were voting for. Lawyers waiting nearby to try and, and dis, to try and discount any vote against the party. One man in the queue is being carried and looks a little pale. And this is because he is dead. And there were cases of dead men somehow still managing to vote in these elections. In the final panel on the bottom right, the votes have been counted and the winning members are being paraded through the streets. 
But despite the celebrations, fighting is breaking out as the people are not, are still not happy. Despite being specific in their references, Hogarth's works are timeless in their messages. The picture room contains 38 paintings on display, but actually holds 118 paintings in total. Soane adds in moving planes, walls that are also doors that open up to show new paintings and spaces. Behind one set of panels, we have another Hogarth series, O'Rake's Progress. This series follows the journey of Tom Rakewell. In the top left image, you see Tom, a young man who discovers upon his father's death, a vast inheritance hidden within his home, literally coins falling from the ceiling. Instead of following through on his promise to marry Sarah Young, the serving girl, after he gets her pregnant, he tries to pay her and her mother off so he can leave the countryside and move to London to become a gentleman. In the next panel, he is being trained in the art of being a gentleman with dancing, fencing and music instructors. He lives the high life during the day and the low life at night. In the next panel, he is being trained. Um, he in the next panel, he is lounging in the arms of the woman from the Rose Tavern in Covent Garden, a well-known brothel of the era. Tom is spending his money left, right, and center. And in the panel at the top right, it is revealed that he has spent too much and he is being arrested by the bailiffs. But he is saved by Sarah Young, who has followed him to London and pays off his debts with her own hard earned money. How does he thank her? He marries someone else. In the bottom left panel, he is being hastily married to a much older woman. So quickly, in fact, her wedding dress is still being sewn up. Why? Because she is rich and Tom needs more money. What does he do next? In the next panel, he goes straight to the gaming house and gambles the money away. He borrows more, loses that, and now ends up in even more debt. This time, he goes to debtor's prison. In the next panel along, he realises his luck has run out. Sarah Young and their child, now born, have come to visit him and have sighted at, uh, fainted at the sight. In the final panel on the bottom right, Sarah holds Tom as he's being chained up in Bethlehem Royal Hospital, the asylum where we get the word Bedlam from. From his time at the Rose Tavern, he contracted syphilis, and combined with the stress of his predicament, has led him to Bedlam. The story is a cautionary tale, not about a real individual, but about many young men who made poor choices with their money. On the opposite wall of the picture room, Two layers of panels open up to reveal a hidden shrine called the Nymph's Recess. Bright yellow light beams down from the skylight above, as if the heavens themselves burst through the clouds to illuminate the space. The central statue of a nymph stands above a model for Soane's Bank of England, as if Soane is offering it to her as a gift. She is surrounded by paintings, some of Soane's designs and some of his contemporaries.
Here is a painting of all the buildings so designed between 1780 and 1815, all contained within a cavernous room also of his design. You might recognize the ceiling from the breakfast room. Brightly lit in the center is the Bank of England, Soane's pride and joy. He worked on it for 45 years, and it was so famous that Tsar Alexander I, when in London in 1814, requested that Soane tour him round the bank and show him the designs. Sadly, Soane's bank no longer exists in its entirety, being largely redesigned in the 1920s. So today you can only see his original outer wall. To the right of the bank is Dulwich Picture Gallery, the first purpose-built gallery in the UK, where Soane memorialized his friend Sir Francis Bourgeois. To the left of the bank, is the front of Pitt's Hanger Manor, Soane's countryside residence. On the bottom left of the painting, cast into shadow, is the facade of number 13 of the museum. And just to the right of it is a small monument shrouded in cloth. This is a funeral monument Soane built to Eliza as she died in 1815, 22 years before Soane did. Soane actually sits in this painting at the table on the right, shadowed by his great works. He was devastated when Eliza died and created this monument for her, which his eldest son, John Jr., would also be buried in, as well as Soane himself. Here is a close-up painting of the grave. Although the dimensions are somewhat exaggerated by the figure on the right, it sits in St Pancras Old Churchyard, previously St Giles in the Fields, and can be visited today. Here we go. This monument has an interesting legacy. 100 years after Soane's death, an architect called Sir Giles Gilbert Scott, who designed what is now the Tate Modern Gallery, Battersea Power Station, and Liverpool Cathedral. He knew the Soane Museum and was later a trustee here. And he entered a competition to design a new version of something. His design was based off Soane's funerary monument. And it won. First appearing in London, then the rest of the UK. If you imagine the grave with a door on it, paint it red, and put a phone inside, mm -hmm. you have the inspiration for the London telephone box. An odd connection to so, but what I think is lovely is although So never got the legacy he wanted, a lot of his buildings don't survive in their entirety. The building he designed out of love for his wife became one of the most iconic images of Britain to date. The Nymph's Recess not only reveals this hidden catalog of paintings, but also a view down into the room below, the picture room becoming a balcony over the monk's parlor. Here we have the monk's parlor, one of the spaces in the basement that looks quite different to the rest of the museum in style. The room is dark, the wooden walls and floors giving it a warmer feel than the rest of the stone basement. The picture on the left shows the space beneath the floor of the museum, 
of the picture room. The ceiling is low and covered in Gothic decoration that hangs above the central table. On the left is a mock altar and grotesques cover the walls. The central picture shows the space directly below the nymph's recess. The warmth of the yellow skylight cascading down onto the desk, which sits beneath two tall stained glass windows, showing a mixture of classical and Christian scenes. Sohn was a classical architect. However, during the time he was working, the neo or new Gothic was becoming more and more popular. His design for the Houses of Commons at Westminster was actually stopped shortly after he started building because they wanted a neo-Gothic building instead. So liked the Gothic style, but hated the neo-Gothic, believing it to be too over the top and derivative. But he wants to keep up with the times. So he created the monk's parlor to say, I can do the neo-Gothic. I could do it very well, but you don't want anything as ridiculous as this. Sohn actually goes one step further in ridiculing the neo-Gothic. And he told people that when he knocked down number 14, he found the ruins of a monastery shown in the courtyard in the image on the right. And there used to be a monk who lived at the monastery called Padre Giovanni. And if you brought a bit of Gothic sculpture that the monk might have liked, you might see the flicker of his ghost in the back room because his grave is out in the courtyard. However, Soane had made all of this up. There was never a monastery in, at Lincoln Inn's fields. Some re, Soane repurposed fragments from the old Westminster Palace to create a fake ruin. There was never a monk here. Padre Giovanni translates out of Italian to Father John. He was Soane's alter ego. There is a grave outside, shown in the image on the right. However, it was in fact the grave to Fanny, the family dog, who of course sadly died on Christmas Day. Soane is once more showing his theatrical flair in this space. But ultimately, he is always trying to promote his architecture. We have now traveled up two flights of stairs to the first floor to visit the drawing rooms. These spaces are very bright, the yellow paint emphasizing the warmth of the stained glass windows on the right. The paint was called Turner Yellow, a very popular color at the time. The drawing rooms were spaces where Soane and his guests could relax after dinner. They would literally withdraw to these rooms for an evening's entertainment. The North drawing room acts as more of a second picture room where Soan could entertain his guests with more paintings of his buildings. In the centre between the two doors is one of our small collection of paintings by J.M.W. Turner. In the centre of the room is a cabinet containing more architectural drawings, which Soan could lay out on the top to show guests. This is the South Drawing Room, a much bigger space with little furniture, a bit of re a relief after the cramped rooms of the rest of the museum. The windows on the right look out over into the fields. And Sohn has built over the original balcony to create the prominent facade of number 13. And in doing so, made a small walkway running along the windows that can hold more objects mm -hmm. and repurpose the window shutters as bookshelves. Eliza would have used this room more frequently, playing music 
or hosting dances. This room also has images of all the family on display. On the right on the wall is the sketch portrait of Eliza I showed you earlier. This sketch is one of the few made during her life as she didn't seem to enjoy sitting for them. But sadly, it was lost to Soane after her death. It was luckily rediscovered by a family friend and presented to Soane as a gift on his knighthood. The friend who rediscovered it was none other than J.M.W. Turner, who was a good friend of Soane and the only person Soane could bear to spend Christmas with after Eliza died. On the back walls of the South Ringham are two paired portraits. On the right, Soane, and on the left, the two sons. Soane's portrait shows him as every bit the architect, pointing to his favourite building from the ancient world. Soane had wanted an architectural legacy to continue after him, and he expected both his sons to follow in his footsteps but was bitterly disappointed. On the left is a portrait of John Jr., the elder son, and on the right, and George on the left. John Jr. had tried to fulfill his father's wishes and become an architect. However, didn't seem to have the passion nor health for it. He struggled with ill health for his life, for most of his life, particularly with his lungs, and sadly died at the age of 37 of tuberculosis, leaving behind his wife and four children. George, on the other hand, was much more rebellious. He wants to be a writer, a career Soan did not approve of. Unfortunately, George also had a vice of overspending, clearly taking the wrong message from a rake's progress and was constantly in debt. Eventually his parents decide not to pay off his bail and let him go to debtor's prison. And he was there for five months before Eliza decided to pay off the debt. So Eliza didn't hear much from him until one day, on Stone's birthday in fact, an article appeared in a newspaper called The Champion. The article was anonymously written and titled The Poor State of Architecture in Britain. And although didn't name Soane, referred to a lot of his buildings. For example, every foreigner who has visited us, they laugh at the heavy lumbering extravagance of the bank. Mm -hmm. So was very offended, but don't, didn't know who to get angry at. Then the article continued two weeks later, this time naming Soane outright. Soane steals a bit here and a bit there, and in piling up these collected thefts, he imagines he has done the duty and earned the honours of an artist. Depraved as is the present taste, such follies will not pass for wisdom. The public laugh at these extravagances, which are too dull for madness and too mad for the soberness of reason. Not only did this article criticise his architecture, but also his home and collection. The possessor, who must stand in the midst of these hoarded volumes like a eunuch in a seraglio, the envious and empining guardian of that which he cannot enjoy. The objects now only valued as a rarity, that by its high price may feed the grovelling pride of its possessor. Some very low blows to Soane exposing that Soane was not born into high society. Soane was proud of this fact, but private about it. 
So he knew whoever had written these articles must know him well. He marched down to the editor of the paper to demand a name. The editor refused, but showed Soane the original manuscript. Soane immediately recognised George's handwriting, and Soane was furious. He went home to tell Eliza this news, but she was more heartbroken than angry, and said, George has dealt me my death blows. She went to bed, and six weeks later, she died. She had suffered from gallstones over the past year, and they were her medical cause of death, but so never, so forever blamed George. This is why, after John Jr. died, Soane went to great pains to make sure the house and collection was left not to George, but to the nation to become a museum. Soane did leave money for all of his grandchildren, including George's, but the only thing he left George in his will were the two articles that he had written, framed with the words death blows written on the frame. Quite a dramatic end to the family story. However, we are grateful to it because without George's bad behavior, we probably wouldn't have the museum today. Oh, there we go. These last few slides show you the spaces of the museum that are so small, they are only accessible on specific tours. This image shows you Eliza's morning room, her study, the only place she really got to decorate as she liked. It is a small yet warm room covered with paintings, with a window looking out over the fields outside. Soane left this room as Eliza had it to remember her by. However, drastically changed her bedroom to accommodate a large collection of objects. This was Eliza's bedroom but is now the model room. The red wall paint and wallpaper soften the light from the stained glass windows, allowing you to take in the immense number of models in this room. The central stand contains the majority, although some models are arranged around the edges of the room. There are three types of models in this room. The white models are made out of plaster of Paris and show the ancient classical buildings as the Georgians thought they might have looked when newly built. So they are not completely accurate. The brown models are made from cork, an unusual material today, but one frequently used at the time because how effectively it recreated the crumbling brickwork of ancient ruins. Cork models were popular souvenirs in Italy, showing the ruins as they looked at the time. Finally, the wooden models show you Soane's own designs. Soane's arrangement of his own designs beneath the models of classical temples suggests that he is following in their footsteps and continuing their legacy. The largest model in the centre of the stand is a model of the ruins of Pompeii, as they looked in the 1820s, still partially unexcavated. Unfortunately, Soane requested that the curator of the museum live on site, and therefore these apartments were lived in up till the 1950s. One curator 
from the late 1800s, James Wilde, decided that this model stand, mainly the Pompeii model, was too big. So decided to cut it in half and throw half away. It wasn't until a few years ago when the museum won a grant to restore these apartments that we could repair the model to its original size. The drawing office is another space that has restricted access and was only restored this year. It is directly above the corridor to the picture room and is a very bright space, once more overcrowded with objects. It was built for Stone's apprentices and students to sketch, study and be inspired by the collection as Stone had been. Today, we now have an artist in residence who can use a space for work as Soane intended. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for joining me today.